what you love, what you'll kill for, what you hate, what the relationship is between you and your thesis advisor, which I think is, is critical uh, to, to the operation of, of all of this. I think the, I mean, what's, what's useful to, to keep in mind with Gertrude Stein is that, that if she thought the answer was no answer, in a literal sense, she never would have been able to write a book. So at least provisionally, she had to say, for the moment, for the duration of this exercise, for this project, I'll say, this is the way it is, I'll develop a narrative, and that'll be the book. So it seems to me, even in that case, the answer is more complicated than that there's no answer. The answer was she was prepared to, to, to supply an answer at least provisionally, which was sufficient to allow her to work on a project and complete it. And we have to do that. You don't have to answer anything in perpetuity, but you have to provide an answer in a period of six months. And then we'll look back on it later and see how it affected the course of it. Okay, you want to jump on your? Deleuze. 
But anyway, I think I think what's what's important in this discussion is what's personal to you, what you learn or what you put together in terms of your own kind of exploration. I have to say that this probably doesn't apply to everyone. Or maybe it applies to everyone in different doses or degrees. So as to, to some of you, this may sound extraneous, and to some of you, it may sound essential and absolutely uh, germane. So I put together some examples uh, of ideas or subjects that have to do with the development of ideas or the criticism of existing ideas or the movement from one idea to another over time. I think what's, what's always interested me, particularly uh, for, for those of you who are lovers of science and technology in the sense that science would give us all a measure of, of exactitude, a kind of precision that we could rely on. And of course, as you look at the movements of science over, over the years, whether it's hundreds of years or even millennia that have to do with who we are and how we got here and how we know, there are huge jumps in, in, in knowledge and understanding. But of course, whenever one arrives at one's own time, there seems to be a disregarding of what we know to be a changing pro forma. It's been difficult, it's been complicated, we didn't know, but wait a minute. Now we know. Now we understand. Now we've got it. And I think my sense is, is that it would be better and in a way more conservative and safer to look at the results of science. And I'll, look, I'll, I'll give you a few examples. And to understand them as provisional, not particularly durable. And since they're not particularly durable, we don't need any allegiances, except provisional. Anyway, this, for those of you who don't recognize it, is Phobos. Anybody know what Phobos is? I think one person. Phobos and Demos are the moons of Mars. And they circle around Mars in tandem. And what's, what's uh, interesting about this image and the behavior of Phobos is it does everything it's not supposed to do in a generic astronomy pro forma of how bodies in the sky operate. It's not a sphere. Uh, it rotates retrograde. It's uneven, rough, raucous. I think the quality of, of the rock is relatively small. And its unfinished state, I think, is, is suggestive to me of the kinds of images that interest me in my own work. That, that it looks like a provisional moon, but in any case, it defies all of the rules that astronomy has, has advocated for many years. And this is interesting. So it does the opposite. And why is that of interest? Or at least, why is it of interest to me? Because when you find an anomaly, or when you find an exception, it seems to me that it changes the frame of reference of the entire discussion. If everything is round and smooth, and rotates in a certain way, then that gives you a way of understanding, mapping, anticipating what might be next. And the next one we find will be like the last Ten that we've understood. But if you understand an exception as changing the rule, then you have a very different way of evaluating the material that's given to you. And I think Phobos is such an exception. And I think suggests, and rightly as it turns out, other exceptions. Venus, it turns out, also rotates When we started here a few years ago, we used, we used uh, uh, a phrase, make it new. And, and the program that we introduced, we 
call Make It New. I don't know whether anybody knew that, or knew this, but the irony of that introduction was that, it, that the Make It New program was 4,000 years old. So the instinct to make it new belonged to a Chinese emperor who apparently had this little piece of calligraphy on his wash basin. And according to the story, he got up each morning and he looked at that, and that gave him a sense of the nature of his, his obligations and how he would feel, fulfill them by looking at the world newly each day as opposed again to following a particular pro forma. And the other reason I stuck it in is there was a project in the thesis last year which, which claimed to be about calligraphy. And I think we'll get into this at, 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 at some point in this discussion. And in my view, whatever its merits, it had absolutely nothing to do with calligraphy at all. Calligraphy, in, in, in this case, this is, this is a way. It's not our way. It's not a European way. It's not a phonetic way. It's not an auditory way. It's a very different kind of language. It's a pictorial language, whereas ours is a phonetic language. And I think, so it, it, it forecasts a very different way of seeing and thinking in the world. I think this is important. No one claimed to be uh, somebody who could provide a perfect translation, but you see this? Three acts and logs. Apparently, this is a combination of the symbol for tree, and the symbol for axe, and the symbol for logs. And the translation of that is make it new. So for the tree, and the axe, and the logs, and now the form of the tree is different. And in a more general sense, this has to do with making it new. I think this is, this is an advocacy for looking again for yourself. And when, when we say make it new, it's not necessarily, I think this is important, it's not new for me. New for me is different than new for you. It's not necessarily new for your advisor, it's new for you. So there may be processes of discussion, analysis, invention, imagination that belong to you if you're Raskolnikov. So if everybody tells you you can't kill anybody, there's still, there, there's still the prospect that you need to swing the axe yourself. Either the make it new axe or the Raskolnikov axe. You know what I mean? In other words, that process of discovery in a personal way, one could argue, is only made possible if you do it and investigate it yourself. So keep in mind, this belongs to you and your discovery. I think this should be clear. Not necessarily the audience who will evaluate it. Make it do means uncover it for you. Yeah. There was, you want to flip back to that? There was, there was one other uh, point that, that, that uh, I stuck into this. Um, this, this quote, uh, what was before impulse is now method. And, and, and what that means is that, that there is, I think, a very fragile quality. And I think an important one for all of us. You don't find it very much. But that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And, and when one tends to see it is in a state of discovery where it's not clear to you where the project will go. And, and everyone will push you toward a conclusion and toward completion. But the initiative of an idea, and one where you're not altogether clear about what it is and where it will go, is a very critical stage, maybe the most interesting stage if you have that capacity to uncover something. That, that you're not certain of. Because so much of the discussion in architecture and lots of other things has to do with people rerunning what they already know. Please don't rerun what you already know. So what the quote means is that, that the first inkling of a new idea or the instinct for a new idea is what we're trying to discover. 
And over a period of time, what it says, what Ovid says, is it turns into a system or a method or a pro forma or a rule. And when it does that, you could argue that what was the discovery mode of the project got lost. And what replaced it, it might look the same. It might look the same. But what got lost is, is precisely the quality of indecision and discovery, which is now replaced by, by a redundancy or a repetition. And you see this in architecture a lot. What was once a discovery becomes a method, and the initiative or the instinct to find something new. Uncertainty is replaced by certainty. So in some ways, we're looking for uncertainty, less so certainty. Uh, this is the, uh, I saw this a few months ago. This is, this is the Lyon Ballet. I, I, I now give you some four instances of these qualities. But when you look at a human being, and you look at a body, and you look at a position, or you look at a human being as solitary, or you look at human beings as collective, when you see these people perform, and they get into these kind of conglomerations of characters out on the stage, and you can't recognize anyone this is not the Kirov or the Bolshoi, it's or the New York City Ballet. This is a very different idea about the amalgamation of pieces, of what people can do physiologically, and how those pieces get stuck together. And it's actually astonishing. And again, when you see it, when you see it, and, and, and you reference it to what you thought was the norm or the rule, you realize that the, 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 the capacity of people to move and dance and reshape a form of, of, of collective intersection and interaction is actually very different than what you thought it would be. So this may change the way you thought about, if you thought about it, what dance meant or what the interrelationship between dance partners meant. It's, it's quite fascinating. Yes, Mark. Um, this I used to use um, a fair amount, and I pulled it out this morning, and I, I think it's, it's for me still uh, very productive. Some of it has to do with, with people like me or coaches. I have a little boy who plays uh, on a soccer club in, in, in Venice for a Brazilian coach who is a crazy, screaming guy. I mean, it's soccer or football and everything else in the world, soccer over here. But, but what's, you know, I, I watch him, I watch him teach, you know, I watch, watch the kids play. And what's, what's fascinating to me is, it's not clear to me it's teachable. And I think maybe that, that's the point of this. Arguably, and this may be an argument in general against the idea that you can teach architecture at all. Maybe you can teach around it. Or maybe you can make certain things possible. So you do certain things with the ball and certain things with your feet certain things with your, you know, certain things in your head, certain things in your mind, certain things in relationship to, to other people. And then you watch it, and, and, and it's, that, it's nothing, and nothing works, and it goes back and forth. And all of a sudden, bang, every, everything clicks, this, 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 and the ball goes in the goal. And then it goes away again. So there, there, there's something about it, this is, this is, admonition to all the Argentinian guys who are always losing to the Brazilian guys, uh, uh, who seem to know how to dance. But, but, but you can't argue your way to it, in a way. I mean, it, 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 it really fascinates me, I'm, I'm repeating myself, the way what, what is about to happen is a complete secret. And then all of a sudden it happens, everything coalesces and then, and bang, and then it all goes away. And I think there's something, there's something in that, which is a kind of, a kind of momentary discovery or insight, which, which is something we would like to try to, to, to capture. Next one. Uh, I showed this the other night, I don't know if this is that, but this is the, this is the Manhattan Project, and Oppenheimer and all these uh, famous uh, guys. 
uh, trying to, to uh, figure out in New Mexico and figuring out ultimately how to, 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 uh, uh, to split the atom. And uh, what, what I think I said the other day, what, what, if I didn't say it, I, I think it was too far on the other side of the room, I couldn't see it so well. But I, what, what I was thinking about when I selected the image was that there's something very different in the art of science and the delivery of science is public policy. So science as discovery or instinct or insight are very different than how it, whether it winds up in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, or propelling a nuclear reactor, moving a car. For, for centuries, people talked about splitting the atom and what that might suggest in terms of how physiologically, in any event, we're made things are made. The purpose to which that was put is a different question. It's a policy question. So the application of science and technology is not the same as the, the original insight or discovery. Uh, this is a pretty well known chapter. It really, it really has to do with, with an instinct to resist what, what seems to be a prevailing technical, mechanical advocacy, and also I think suggests that, that the intervention between, the intervention by a human being in the, in the actions of the machine redefines the machine. There's the machine as an advocacy, buildings that look like machines, make my building like a crankshaft, all of that or the advocacy, which, which I think in general terms has for a long time suggested that a radical piece of architecture had to do with, it, with a very particular affinity with the image of machinery. And I think, I think Chaplin is suggesting a very different kind of relationship between the machine and the image of the machine in us. Yes. Um, Similar discussion, this is the, the universe according to Ptolemy, so it all, it all happens around the Earth. Everything is related to the Earth. The Earth is the center. It's not so much whether he was right or Copernicus was right or whoever the next person will be is right. It's very interesting that, that these diagrams seem to be essential to all of you, like the map back to your apartment. In order to give your life a form, or to give it an order, to allow you to understand we're here, everybody else is there, as opposed to who knows where everyone else is. But what, what complicates it is the understanding that, that however necessary it is psychologically, it's also, it, it also is not very durable. You're looking at a map and you understand, you're looking at a road map and actually you understand if you go six inches under the street, it's all dirt. Next. Uh, another one, this is, this is uh, North and South America here. Uh, uh, they look a little different today and may look different again tomorrow. Uh, but what's, what's again of interest is that however inaccurate this was that it facilitated it was a way of, of understanding at a particular point in time which allowed certain things to go forward which led to other things so if you see ideas as a way of getting from one point to another that's very different than seeing ideas as eternally durable next um, and then there's the other side of the equation, actually, which is we need a system in a psychotherapeutic way, or we need a rule system. And then every once in a while, somebody comes along and says, wait a minute, let's not pay any attention to the rule system. Let's defy the rule system. Let's denigrate the rule system. Let's understand it in a very different way. Uh, there are a series of these. A, a, a somewhat different kind of advocacy having to do with projects 
that relate to public policy on a very large scale. Uh, there have been some discussion of those here. Peter Zellner uh, set up a, a couple of discussions in the city over the last few weeks that I think are, have, have been very productive. This is Robert Moses in Coney Island and Grand Central Parkway and the World's Fair and all of that. But a willingness to actually, a willingness and a confidence and I think the confident, a willingness of confidence, a willingness to suspend the, the sense of democracy or egalitarianism, which is so prevalent theoretically in planning in this city, and say it has to be like this on a very large scale, and it's for the following reasons. It seems to me somebody in this audience should be willing to take on very large scale projects and to say, this is the way it should be. Ptolemy said it. Moses said it. You can say it. Yes. And uh, ditto uh, uh, an old uh, teacher from uh, Kenzo Tange at Tokyo Bay, which it, at some level, I think, looking back on it now, is considered either environmentally destructive or just simply audacious. But the confidence and the capacity of architecture, whatever the ephemeral nature of ideas, to step in and remake the world or the city or a piece of the city, I think is also something, paradoxically, we want to encourage. Next. And this, these, these two, you can, this one, and you can go to the next one, sir. Uh, the two very large projects, which I, which I think are also an intersection of both an enlarged technical capacity and, and a supreme confidence that if you want to redo New Orleans in the area uh, uh, surrounding it, uh, as a consequence of many the hurricane and especially Katrina, you got to move the river. You want to move the river, we can move the river, we can tell you how to do it. Put the river here, sand dunes there, we can make it work. Uh, so the, the willingness to take that on, to, take, to have that confidence and to suggest since we have the technical capacity, to put it in the service of a very particular, and I made a distinction between science as art and science as policy. This is science as policy, and it requires an advocate in the same way Moses was an advocate. And the other one, I'm talking about the one that just passed, and, and this one, I bumped into this a, a couple of years ago, um, uh, which is this project that, that uh, aspired to connect the Han, the Han and the Nakdong River at a cost of about $20 billion in the mountains in South Korea and to make a continuous river connecting Japan and China through Korea, recreational use, urban use, of an entirely of something which is two now becomes one. So the aspiration to do that, to do something colossal, to change the meaning of a country. It is funny, paradoxically, I was, I was there, I don't know, a few weeks ago to, to do a, a number of things, including to give a little workshop. And they asked me, they pleaded with me not to give this project. Didn't want to hear about this project. It's, it, it was considered, even though it's part of the election, which is of course now over, that it was too difficult, that it, that, that it was too controversial. But anyway, I think what, what we would very much like to see, certainly what I would like to see, is the courage to take these subjects on, not simply as an advocacy of a particular technological tool. And we know going into the mountains and bulldozing the mountains and cutting the river and all of that is, 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 is certainly a controversial strategy, environmental. Nevertheless, now, um, this I think has to do with, with architecture or building as almost anything, meaning what is it? What are the limits of it? What are the possibilities of it? What could it be like the Lyon Ballet that you don't know, haven't seen, and don't recognize? You don't have to do something we all recognize. You're entitled to do something we don't. Next. Uh, 
similar similar uh, subject, but but presented differently. It's the Mal Rose book, which is which is well known. We accept a definition of of museum that that handles history or art or sculpture or the bones of dinosaurs and so on. Is that so? Is that the way those things should be seen? Is that the way those subjects should be explained? Is that the way they should be understood? Anybody asking? We need to ask. And this was his point. Next. Uh, I mentioned this the other night. This is really what is uh, what is a monograph. And I, this is a book that, that we're making now that'll come out in the middle of the summer. But it's somehow a cross between uh, the building code, the dictionary, and the Bible. Uh, and, and it's. <laughs> And, and so it's of interest to us in terms of, of, of how it's done and why it was done and what its subject matter is. So what's a book? Next. Uh, this has been around for a while, but, but I think the subject is of interest to me uh, for the following reason, if you, if you can't read it. So this is the ubiquitous 9-11 Commission and Richard the Lion Martin on trial. Uh, and it has to do with the continuity of ideas across time, the discussion of history, uh, which is from time to time a subject here. And, and one of the things that I would like to ask of you, which seems almost so, so consistently missing in the presentation of thesis projects, is if there are ideas, this I, I think doesn't compromise your originality, but if there are ideas, if there are points of view, if there are subjects that are antecedents, if there are examples that are precedents, so the context of your discussion, I mean, Moses in, 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 in New York City, or Bush in New Orleans, or the Han and the Nakhdan might all be precedents for large-scale projects and would be worth at least noting or mentioning. I think this also has to do with the development, by extension, with the development of your own project. Because when you make a project, it has its own antecedents in your own work and in the history of the project. And one of the peculiar things about the representational tools that are available to us is the game seems to be to make it look finished. And it's not finished. And it looks finished. And what we miss in evaluating it is a chronology, you know, I went here, and then I went here, and then I picked this, and then I picked that. So some semblance of a sequence, which is a thought process, how you came to be what you are. Because in a way, by the time you get to the end, it's too late. So we want to see, and we'll have to see the end, but we want to see the chapters that lead up to the end. Next. This is another version of that uh, chronology, history, uh, over time. Nero built a house, some of you know it, it's called the Domus Aurea. And Trajan came along, not too long afterwards, and slammed his baths into the top of Trajan. Couldn't knock it down. The interrelationship of the two is fascinating. So the way history moves, and the way building in cities develops over time is not always holding hands and walking off into the sunset and kissing goodnight. Sometimes it's very friendly, sometimes it's very congenial, sometimes somebody claims to be a conservationist, like in the place we're sitting at the moment. But, but there are other structures and other constructions over time that have to do with, with the interrelationship between what you're doing and what preceded you, and how those two are interrelated. Nobody says it has to be uh, uh, reviewed by the conservancy. 
can be reviewed by Trajan, it can be re reviewed by Nero. That's plausible. You may agree, you may disagree, but there are precedents for that and actually fascinating precedents. Next. Um, this, this I mentioned the other night also. This, this is from a film, uh, you, should, you should rent it. It's, it's made in 1928. Victor Seastrom, a Swedish uh, director, it's called The Wind. And it has to do with the, the in my point, which is not his point, uh, has to do with the interrelationship of ideas as you see something or suggest something which pertains to something else or which provokes a thought or moves you in a direction. So much of the work we see now and you do now is only about itself. And it uses itself as its own reference. That's it. In this case, the Indian story here was the Indian legend was that the wind is a horse in the sky. The wind is a horse in the sky. You see a horse flying across the sky. You don't know that, but the association of the qualities of the animal and the qualities of the wind, I think in a poetic sense, not so much as an argument, but when you see it visually, is enormously powerful. And the ability to make those connections in, as, as an architect, in a poetic way, is rare, but it's possible. So it doesn't only have to be about you and what somebody told you to draw or to model or to think. It can have other kinds of association and provoke very different ideas outside the conventional framework of the architectural, normal architectural discourse. Um, and not for if you go to the end. Huh? Yeah, because, because in most of the, I mean, the, the points are, are, are different in detail, but the same in general. This is, this is a film which, it's funny, we were, we were uh, we're having a discussion recently about whether we should do the studios in the fall and give everyone the same program. So every vertical studio has the same program, different faculty, different as opposed to, to, to uh, uh, advertising the projects with different projects and different faculty, different faculty, same project. And one of the possibilities for that program is this film which was made, I think, in the 1950s, 1960s by a well-known uh, Japanese filmmaker by the name of Akira Kurosawa. And essentially, you have to see it. I won't go through all the details, but the essence of it is that there are a number of people who view an event, an incident, and tell the story of that event in, in colossally different ways in very, very different ways, which are to some extent of not so much ever a reflection of what is true intrinsically. Maybe that's left to the person who watches it, although the implication may be that nobody is capable in the end of saying what's so. But it's fascinating to see these, these, the amalgamation of these very different vantage points. Next one. Uh, and, and then the, the uh, computational advocacy, which I, which I think has become very clear. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the idea that, that, that what is essential to our affairs can be written as a code and scripted and I think we can talk about this in more in detail, but of course it, it leaves out anything topically which is not amenable to codification. So it's like many other architectural allegiances that we've discussed over the last century. That it has, it, it probably gains its power as much for, for what it leaves out as for what it includes, but what I'm interested in is that if you use it, you understand what it is, and you also understand what it isn't, which doesn't typically happen with believers. Next. Uh, 
Um, and this is this is an interest I think of ours going forward at SciArc. Uh, not an attempt to make it sillier to cartoon, but to see if there are venues, larger scale venues, where we might interrelate the making of public policy with with strategies for for cities uh, and for architecture as opposed to leaving those subjects out of the discussion next i bet you can't find this in, in your computer what is this anybody know what this is what is it tell me what it is Protest. <laughs> I guess I asked the question. What is it as a meaning? What is it as a meaning in terms of immigration, end of nations, movement of populations, Anglo guys, Hispanic guys, black guys? What's this, what's the subject? Difficult subject. How do you Google that? Can you Google that? Next. Uh, this is another one that, that I think uh, is more and more pers uh, pervasive in, in our world and, and accepted very uncritically, I think, the role of, because I think the, 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 the meaning of a brand is not an essence in the same way that a Mondrian painting might go after an essence or Plato's cave would be uh, uh, the shadow of an essence. I think this is, this is debilitating in terms of thinking. This, this, these are, this is an advocacy of what you're taught to respond to just like that. So it, you, you, you learn that the world is structured in a certain way and there are very particular recognizable symbols to which you respond. And politicians have done this, armies have done this, propagandists have done this, and, and, and people who sell coffee and shoes do this. And I almost never hear, I mean, when you talk to, talk to architects, somebody's working for Nike, this is Nirvana. It's not. I say don't work for Nike, but you have to understand what these things mean, what the symbols mean, what they're telling you to do, what they're teaching you to respond to, and to look in a more circumspect way at that kind of world. Next. Similarly, um, I, I think what is of interest to me in a discussion like this, although it doesn't happen much, is that, that these points of view almost inevitably lead to somebody saying, okay, I'll pick this one and I'll be this. Could be therapy, could be religion, could be a drawing or modeling technique. I'm a modernist, I'm a neo-modernist, I'm a post-modernist, I'm a digital guy. You see it, I mean, you see it in terms of people who come up here to speak every Wednesday night and so on. It's about, it's about allegiances and belief systems. What's, I think, worth looking for is, is not so much that you pick one, but you understand, even if you do, that there are a number and that the tension between possible choices may be where the truth lies, in between a selection, not the selection of one and the denigration of the other five. Yes. <laughs> this is a, I, I like this painting. I'm not quite, this is the blind leading the blind. Um, and and it, it's a difficult subject matter visually, and people are falling down and so on, Bruegel. Um, but some of it may have to do with, I think, my sense that, that feeling one's way or understanding that, that in, in a very fundamental sense, we probably know less about everything than we think we do. Uh, and it's not so much we just have a few details to fill in. So this could be a metaphor for, for a prospect of, of human thinking or thesis thinking, not in a negative way, but in a kind of
feel your way because I'm not sure. Next. John Cage, um, a very, there was a lady who stood up here in a symposium the other day, um, your friend, I, I can't remember her name, but oh, I, Joanne, yeah. And, and, and she said, music, I'm a composer and music is the harp and the Taj Mahal. And this, this is what she said to the audience, and I guess everybody understood it, but I didn't understand it. And, and I think that, that what's, what's fascinating about John Cage, I had a student at Yale, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, a lady went to the Beinecke Library and Xerox for me every score, every single score John Cage ever made. And I spent a lot of time looking at it. It's too bad in a way that only the musicians get to see it. The audience doesn't get to see it, so you have to, if you ever listen to this stuff, and you're better than I am, I can't listen to it. I've tried very hard. But looking at it is fascinating, and the conception of music, which is now, in, in, in many ways, not an auditory conception, but a visual conception, meaning you're making things that look like something, and the relationship to what you hear is, anybody's guess, but certainly it's not Stravinsky, and it's not Bartok, or it's not Beethoven, it's something else. So this is a, a fascinating redefinition, and this is, this is at least a possibility that the frame of reference for saying what music is actually is stretched by this. It lies completely outside of a normative uh, uh, explanation of what would constitute music. Next. Drawing, I wanted to say a word of it. This is a drawing of, of Michael Graves uh, uh, for a project. It's a, a, a guy who worked in a certain way with a certain texture, with a certain line weight, with a certain color. And I think this is actually very critical and, and worth seeing in the production of theses. So, you, so your way of, of what comes from your head and comes from the keyboard, comes from your hand, models, drawings, all of that. In, 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 for me, in my preference, is that they would be as, to the extent possible, personal that they belong to you, and that the use of drawing and the use of models is, is related to a way of thinking and a way of understanding that's your way of thinking and your way of understanding. And pretty clearly in terms of a definition of architecture, what he builds and what he draws have a very close interrelationship. So we're looking for that. Less the generic advocacy less the generic drawing type, and more the interrelationship of a drawing, a modeling idea, with a way of thinking about a subject which belongs not to everybody in the room, but to you. Yes. I think this is, this is the last one. It's, it's related. It has to do with, um, this, is, this is a show we did at the uh, American Academy for Arts and Letters, I think a year or so ago, uh, which, is, which is less the issue then what you put up on the wall and how you put it up, how big, how tiny, how legible, how illegible, in what sequence, with what lessons in mind. And I think the mounting of an exhibition and the way the work is explained, how it's drawn, how it's modeled, and how it's presented is also a critical aspect of this discussion. Thanks.
Um, one of the things you say is um, you have to define uh, what is it and what it isn't. But how do you make it new if that's defined? You have to know what it is and know what it isn't. And don't try to make it what it isn't, but kind of understand what yeah, it is. But this is not so easy in, in, in any way. I think this might be an aspiration, or it might be an idealization. I don't know that you know. We're talking about what you would aspire to, or even if you can't do it in a certain sense, that you know you understand the limits of what you're doing. And I think, I think this is important. In other words, are you doing what everyone else is doing? Are you using what you have as an architect? If you think, and this is, this is a debatable point, that architecture is personal, we've always said that. And you educate architects one architect at a time. That's a little bit true and a little bit BS, but, but there's some truth in it. And, and uh, I think what what I'm arguing for is a level of self-consciousness of the work as you do the work. So you have some feeling for what belongs to you and where you might want to take it, as opposed to just following a precedent which has been set for you by three years of classes or particular advisors and so on. I would like to see that relationship between students and advisors is somewhat more adversarial, you know, and uh, it looks like I, it looks like my project, great, more, you know, it actually shouldn't be that way. And that, that also requires that advisors have to be able to see outside their own frame of reference. seems to me that what you're trying to imply is that there is a, you know, there's a definitely particular personal style, the way you draw, the texture, and so on. Now, you could not see those drawings, you know, unless you've seen, uh, you know, other Rossi's drawings and depiction of certain things. Meaning, you know, there's certainly a precedent to even the most innovative things. So, that's one of the things. I mean, my, my, my take on it, and I think, uh, well, I don't know if you agree or not, but, uh, is that, there's always that kind of level of influence, and that is actually pervasive as it is technology. And it would be foolish to deny it. The question is how you can move beyond that. Right. So you bring the question. Yeah. Point. No, but then the other thing is that you bring the question of uh, personality, which I think is a, it's, it's a very important one. So it brings him back to Rossi. I mean, he probably wrote one of the most beautiful books in architecture, uh, you know, scientific autobiography. I'm sure you read and loved it. For me, what's interesting about the book is that it's a very personal view. You know, he goes on, uh, it's a critique of modernism uh, based on his own memory of, like, you know, some of even like Russian, Russian, uh, uh, sort of totalitarian regime style. And uh, he describes it obviously in a very interesting way. Uh, now, he makes a personal point which, you know, uh, could have been totally irrelevant. But it happens to be very relevant because he uses to launch, you know, a critique to some of the, you know, big faults of modernism. It seems to me that many times we don't see that that uh, you know process of teasing. You see the personal part, but sometimes you don't see the kind of relevancy of that argument in relation to a particular context in a way. And so you have to kind of be able to balance both. And so I mean, this is not the question; is more common. And I think. How do you, you know, how can one strengthen the kind of personality of the things but being able to say, well, you know, this is totally relevant at times, you know, you know, how many people have done it, you know, we've seen it in the school, and we have to be able to correct that. And I think as teachers uh, in the school, we have to be able to say at some point, as you said, you know, provisionally, this is wrong, you know, it's not scientific, but we've seen it a lot, you know, it's been done, it's not really relevant, it's not a thesis, or it's not a thesis as we call it. You know? The problem is scientific isn't scientific. Uh, but I, I mean, I, 
which I which I was trying to say with the Manhattan Project. I think you're right. I think we have to. We, how many theses have you seen in the last few sessions that deal with antecedent projects, the way you're describing the relationship of Graves drawing to other people who drew in related ways? You don't see that very much. When you're talking about a drawing technique. I'm more talking about subject matter. And subject matter has to do with education, and it has to do with the, the, the literacy of the student who understands not only what the student wants to do, but understands the history that surrounds the project. And you don't see very many thesis projects where that's presented, and it needn't be half the wall. It could be a couple of examples where you, where, where you put the precedence down. And the other side of that, or the other piece of that equation, would be the process or the chronology of the development of this thesis project and how it evolved and how it got to be what it was. You don't get much of either one of those. And I think we'll get more if we ask for that. And you ask for that in the preliminary reviews, which again, I think, is, by the time you get to the end, it's too late. But in the preliminary reviews, it sure is hell not too late. And we have to ask for that. So to some extent, what we get is what the students do. And to some extent, what we get is what we deserve or what we ask for. So I think, I think the faculty has a huge role in that, in that discussion. In each one of these, we actually encounter much more interesting conversations than the final thesis itself. Uh, so I kind of witnessed the downfall of like many ideas just to the detriment of the image itself. So at some point, I think that those kind of uh, 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 um, um, interesting problem, which is that the management of the thesis anxiety, and kind of on the fact that the thesis has to be finished on a certain day, it's like imagining Einstein finishing the theory of relativity by a certain day, and then publish it the next day and say that's said and done. And I think that somehow the words are coming a little bit to that, to that problem itself, which is like kind of the curatorial aspect of like what do we expect out of the thesis? Not necessarily what a thesis is, but rather kind of how it is presented and what is the context and, and so on. So when you ask, for example, about like something in a cultural context and the idea of what the thesis might be about, you're not gonna see it because kind of like the show and the presentation itself doesn't accept that. I mean, it's just like, it's not part of the game, it's not part of kind of how we wanna be seen and, 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 and so on. So I think that that's something that we kind of, seldom, we don't really talk about those kind of issues, but I think that there's something about kind of how the thesis is handled, presented, or assumed in terms of kind of what we need to get out from the school point of view and from the student's point of view. I think that everybody's kind of making a choice on a certain trajectory of investigation, which is like, okay, how are we going to present the work? And that's what it tends to be homogeneous, which is everybody kind of arrives at the same development stage. And the problems kind of, you know, take a little bit of a back roll, and then intuition kind of takes over. So I, I think that's a, it's, a, it's a very different problem. Altogether, maybe it bridges a little bit the discussion from a different point of view. Well, the, the, the Einstein analog, I guess probably probably stretches it <coughs> stretches it a little bit. Um, I think I think there's there are different kinds of pressures and different sorts of obligations that do belong to this discussion. Because on the other hand, you don't want to say do a thesis and turn it in sometime in the next generation. And, and so I think, I think whereas Einstein might have been committed to something that had certainly evolved anyway over a period of time and as, as his thinking changed, at any point in the discussion, he probably, at least in our, in our frame of reference, could have been called to account. And in any case, that's what we're doing. We're not saying you have to commit yourself internally. We're just saying you have to commit yourself for six months and I think this is okay. It's actually in a practical sense, practical, impractical sense, for people who produce work for, for building departments or public presentations or competition deadlines or, or the reviewing shop drawings so the guy makes his deal or whatever it is. All of those kinds of interventions 
between what's in your head and what the world asks from you are part of, of part of the production of architecture. They might be more distasteful or less distasteful. You might be able to move them in one way or another in some cases and not in others. But I think to obligate a student to produce a body of work in a certain time frame has a component, an obligatory component, which is it belongs to you, it belongs to you, it belongs to a bigger discussion. And if you want to participate in that discussion, if the competition is due on the 1st of July, and you want to be in the game, you get it in the 4th of July, hasta la vista. But you don't have to do it. But once you join the game, I think so, so that part of it, I think, is, it, it doesn't trouble me. I think, I think there's a reality to that, which I think isn't the ultimate reality, but it, it would be useful that it would be recognized, because if it's not recognized, if the ultimate reality is the implementation, you ain't implementing if you ain't submitting. So I, I, think, I think there's that. The nature of the presentation, or the or the relative depend. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that the work should be presented at some time in the, in the near future, but rather, kind of, how do you filter and edit your work to kind of like accomplish that that day? And I think that that editing process is the one that tends to be pretty. pretty Maybe it doesn't have to be finished. Maybe but, you could have, have three, four hypotheses. But, but we're assuming that there's an editing part of the, you know, a long history of developing any one idea that has to be edited for such and such day. We are, you know, we have a certain amount of, we have a certain bits of count to, to, to account for. So I think that editing process of kind of how like, the information goes from idea into presentation is something that kind of, we might tend to do it in a very particular way, in a very silent way. That's kind of something that you can well, that's too bad if that's true, but I think there's room well, for a discussion. That might be part of the problem. Well, that, that's, kind of, I mean, but that's, then, where, that's where my question is going. But that belongs to a discussion between an advisor or a couple of advisors and a student and how you make choices. I mean, what I was saying is related to what you're saying, and I think what you're saying is a good point. The question is how to make that a subject. And one way you make it a subject is by recording the history of the project. So if nothing else, you can see what steps were taken, and you can, and you can follow the development, or what you call the editing, of an idea, or a group of ideas. And it could be in, in, in one form or another that the, that the final idea is not the final idea. There could be, you know, and, and, and you can, in, in, I was reading something the other day about, about the making of Casablanca. They didn't know, maybe you know this better than I do, but they didn't know how it was going to end. And they wrote several endings. And you could plausibly do a thesis, which is if we do this, we get this. If we do this, we get this. If we do this, we get this. Which keeps alive the possibility of options as opposed to committing yourself to a single option. Now, there, it, I mean, it would have to be sufficiently developed to make the point that the point here is different than the point here, different than the point here. I think a lot of what you're talking about would have to do with those kinds of subjects being on the table. I just don't think they're on the table enough. I'm really happy that we've, we, we've come back to uh, some of these images that, that you brought today because it, it brings us back to where we were with Brett uh, the other day and also to, to make a connection to your own talk. One of the things that I, I liked the most, absolutely the most about that previous talk, talk was seeing that word pieces with a question mark after it. That question mark is a beautiful thing to see at this hierarchy, I think. It, it, yeah, I mean, it, it announces a thesis stabilized, perhaps threatened, perhaps perhaps being anachronized, um, and maybe in that way we can produce a condition a set of theses that are not, say, part of a self-improvement program, not a march of precedence, and offer no closure, which sounds pretty good to me, um, especially for students who are in this weird space of operation between being professional architects and students, which is a wonderful time of work. But also, in, in terms of what you've just been saying now, 
that the thesis right now at SIRE, at this school, can produce a kind of question mark here that is different from a discussion thesis question mark, say, at Penn or at Yale or at Harvard or wherever else, and that thesis at SIRE is not only producing instability, but is itself in a state of instability. But I think right now that makes that makes thesis at SIRE much more interesting than, than has been my experience in the last few years. I, I love the question mark, so. Yeah, I would argue with I would argue that we do thesis with an exclamation mark. Not necessarily <laughs> not necessarily not necessarily a question mark. <laughs> well thesis with a question mark for for this semester, for next semester we tend to do exclamation mark. This part of branding that you love so much. I mean I, you know it, it's not so much love of confusion it's if you find yourself confused it's because you can't find your way out of it not because you didn't try so confusion is not an advocacy it may be a condition which is more or less inevitable it's not please be confused because that's better than to be simple I think those are decisions that people have to make individually. Because in a way, if you, if, you, if, you, if you describe it the way you're describing it, it also turns into an ideal or even an image. And I, I think that what, what's useful is the process of trying to find your way to a conclusion and mapping the process whether you actually arrive at that or not. But not simply saying it's unmappable and illegible. I'm not sure how quite you put that down because then are you trying or are you giving up? And if you're giving up, we're not interested. We're not interested in anybody who gives up. We're interested in, in trying and how you try and how that effort is recorded. And maybe for, for particular students at particular points in time, there is a solution, and there is a conclusion, and there is a belief system. And I don't want to preclude that either. That's why I said a lot of this has to do with a personal point of view. It shouldn't apply, it should only apply where it applies. You have to decide if it applies, not me. something or make something 
who study something or advocate a particular use of a tool um, or a planning strategy or something, you could tell when you looked at the results, I think you could tell, the student could tell, the faculty could tell, the jury could tell, the nature of what was being taken on so that whether it, whether it ultimately succeeded or whether you could say it didn't succeed and this is why it didn't succeed and this is what I'll do next in an attempt, in an attempt to remedy it. So I think then, then, then the issue of failure or, the, or failure as a substantial, as, as an achievement has to be understood in a, in a certain way. It's not failure is good, confusion is good. You're not trying to fail. You're trying to succeed. But if you take something on and it doesn't work, and we can document that and discuss it, then we, we've moved the discussion in any event. The Korean thing is, is very complicated. Yes, it's about understanding the question, recognizing the question to begin with. Uh, well, I think, Eric, um, 
it's funny, it, you know, built into the etymology of the word thesis, it, it, it comes not so much from ontology, right? It's not about a thing that is, but it's actually a determination of style, right? A thesis is a specific kind of timekeeping to help oral cultures say complicated things, right? So a thesis is putting the foot down and a marxist is lifting the foot up. I talked about this in the, in the beginning of the thesis lectures. And, I mean, the point of it is, is that, that that etymology points to thesis having to do not so much with what it is or is not, but, but rather how it's done, right? That if an idea is felt to be ready for an audience, it's presented in a certain way, right? And that, that way, that, that's that kind of you know, personal contribution or whatever we might want to call it. And, and I think that, that that in a way speaks to this question of success or failure. Right, that, that if you sort of have put a stamp on a, on an idea, it might be a familiar idea, but you've changed it in some way, put it in a particular mode of presentation, and presented it at a certain time and made an impact, then I think that, you know, it's not that it works as a building or it doesn't work as a building, but, but the, the thesis becomes a way of kind of putting an idea in the world. And the concentration I think we need to just be reminding ourselves has to do with how you put that Right, so that it is possible for us to kind of attack similar problems again and again and again, but until they get presented in a certain way, it's maybe not so interesting. I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too uh, concerned about the nomenclature. I think that's really not the point. I don't really care what you call it. It's a premise. A thesis is just a premise. It's a point of view. It may be yours originally, it may be something you're trying to substantiate which belongs to 10 other people. It's a premise. And I think our argument in a pedagogical way was that having dealt with students and told them and educated them in terms, <clears throat> in terms of, of representation, in terms of history, in terms of technical issues, in terms of underlying social, or political, or economic, philosophical concepts that it would now turn around and in a way they would give back to you what you had given to them. It's the old, you know, what I said and what you heard. So you could call it that. What I said, what you heard. And getting into this, this other argument about whether it's the right subject or the wrong subject, I think we're looking to see what you heard and your response to that and talking about what those responses could be. I think that's, that's, that's a legitimate proposition as opposed to the alternative, which is simply what I said. And you never get a chance to say on your own what you heard. And I think we're saying you need that opportunity to define a point of view, however provisional, however abbreviated. This is okay. I would like if some of the students put some of the questions, especially those who resist and still are here, because I would say part of our problem in this issue is the lack of patience that science and students have for this kind of conversation. Like half of you guys left. That for me is part of our problem. Uh, I think it's something that we need to improve how we develop a sense of patience to discuss some of these issues. Anyway, that's kind of a footnote criticism, but I would like some of you guys to jump in the conversation because that, those are the ones that they say, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what my thesis is. So, okay, this is group therapy. <laughs> so let's get it out. Many of you are vocal in private rooms. I think as a student, when you come to this school, you've got to suspend some of your own beliefs in architecture to kind of absorb some of the work that's being done here. I think we've all kind of chosen to come to this school to, for stylistic intent or the, the teachers or the way the school is run. And in some part, you've got to give yourself up to allow yourself to kind of receive some of the information that's being given before you, can, you have a chance to turn around and be super critical of that. So it's, it's, a, it's a quick turnaround 
flip-flopping from student to professional, where on one day, you know, you're, you're trying to kind of work within the confines of what your professors kind of set out uh, for you in the studio, and then the next day saying, I don't believe any of it, and this is how I'm going to make it new. And a lot of that also goes, um, goes to the fact that when teachers teach their students that um, they can't teach everything they know. They've been in school, and they've been working in, um, on their own in the fields that they believe are relevant in architecture for 10 years or more. And that we've only been here um, trying to suck it up for two and a half years, three years. So on the one hand, they can't teach everything that they know uh, about those kinds of subjects to us. So we're only able to take in maybe 10, 15% of all the things that they are knowledgeable of. So when we go and try to give it back to them, you know, we're trying to tell them what they don't know. Um, that it's really not so much that they don't know it, it's that we don't know it. It's that, that this, is, this is where our education's been lacking, and so all these questions that we're posing are the things that we haven't figured out yet from all the things that we've been taught. And, that, and unfortunately, sometimes that makes the, the things that we don't know maybe not so relevant in contemporary culture, or maybe not so relevant in, in the arguments that are happening in architecture at the moment. It's just you know, that it's new for us. I mean, I, I think the points are, are good points and fair points. I don't think in an extreme sense that it, you shouldn't misunderstand the nature of the presentation. So this is not this is not an argument that you would that you would entirely separate yourself from the world that we inhabit or from SciArc or from your advisor. It has more to do with a mindset and a certain independence, which is an advocacy, an independence of from what surrounds you and some capacity to look at it, think about it, and say, is this a plausible argument? Is this a way to see? Is this a way to work? Is this a way to think? If it is, okay. If it isn't, how might it not be? But it's not everything in one direction and everything in the other direction. The other side of that, which, which is a little bit dicey, in discussions of how can you stand up and say what Obama should have said in Prague? You don't know. You weren't there. You don't know. You know. You don't know Prague from Vienna, probably. And if you follow that, uh, not personal, but most of the subjects, in a general sense, that that, that are part of a larger artistic, social, political, economic discourse. You know, what do you think of swaps and derivatives? You work much in that area. But I think you, you can probably put some basic information on the table and you can probably come to some conclusions that are not astonishing conclusions, actually. And some capacity to look at not only architecture, but to look at the world which has something to do in some cases with what architecture is or what it does or where it goes and operate in a critical way to some extent is part of living anyway, you know? And my, my guess is you had many the opinion on American adventures in Iraq or Afghanistan or lots of other places and yet probably haven't been to Iraq, probably not an expert in a lot of those subjects so I would just be a little bit careful of the experts who, who know everything. You know, whether it's the bankers or the appraisers or the insurance guys or the, you know, Geithner or Summers, whoever it is. And that doesn't mean you wouldn't have some respect for someone with some either experience or some history in the subject. But you could retain your independence and your critical capacity nevertheless. And I think that's really what I'm saying. I think I think one of the most poignant things that I took away from the Brent C lecture was his comment that uh, that a thesis is not so much the. I think one of the more poignant things that I took away from the Brent C lecture was not so much that the thesis is the design of a project, but the design of an argument. Um, and what I thought was sort of interesting was its comparison to uh, to the way that a lawyer operates. That. Um, so can you sort of maybe make a comment upon that? There's sort of a tenuous relationship, I think, in a thesis between um, remaining, 
uh, you know, sort of investigating your own interest in a subject matter, but also in turn trying to uh, develop and gain an audience uh, to put behind you uh, regarding that subject matter. And, you know, and sort of attempting to gain uh, that audience, which I think Kibnis always sort of reiterates to us that architecture is always about developing an audience. Um, how, how do you kind of um, see managing that relationship between kind of remaining true to yourself, but also establishing an audience to propel, you know, your reasoning forward? Developing an argument in an area that you know, and it's a question of how to state a sequence of points that would lead you to a conclusion, I think you're doing something that I'm suggesting is actually what you shouldn't do. I mean, I don't agree with, with, with Brett, I think he gave a great presentation. I don't think I agree with his, to me it was, to me, it was the, the commentary of somebody who doesn't make things. It was not the commentary of somebody who does make things. It was also retrogressive. It was looking at things that have been made 60 years later in light of certain presumed results. I mean, if you take any of them, if you, took, if you take Bob Venturi's project or his argument, it wasn't the kind of argument, at least from my point of view, that I'm talking about. You don't know why he selected what he selected, what he left out. You don't see it in that form. It was, per, it was presented as a conclusion. That might be a legal argument. I don't think that's an architectural argument or a thesis argument. In other words, eliminate everything that doesn't substantiate the conclusion. So I think the kind of argument, if you want to use that word that I'm talking about, is that you would include a whole series of things that might not substantiate the conclusion, but in a certain sense might be suggestive that, that the conclusion itself is a compromise or there are other ways that the project could have been pursued, which is not the kind of argument you would make in a court where you're trying to win and you're trying to persuade a jury. The other, the other argument about, about creating an audience uh, is, again, it is, is a tactical and a political argument. Venturi actually took on, just to pick on him, because Brett talked about his work, took on, essentially, the audience, or at least the majority of the, the, the huge majority of the audience. He was fighting the conventional opinion probably weren't three guys around him other than the, the, the instructor we were talking about who really would have supported that kind of argument. He could have, he could never have made that thesis, I wouldn't think, at Harvard. He could only, probably only could have done it at Princeton and at maybe I mean, it has to do with who's teaching and what was possible in that context. So he actually, I mean, whether he was looking for an audience or not, um, I, I don't know, but but you, you probably the best way to, to find an audience is to test the wind to see what's being supported and find a way to get more of those people to side with you. I don't think that's what you want to do. I think he was the opposition. He was the adversary. Everyone was his enemy. Everyone. I don't think that's a way, in, 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 in retrospect, he then was, was a voice added to other voices, which, which I think started to suggest the limitations of what is considered to be doctrinaire modern architecture. So he took it apart. And in the end, he had quite a substantial audience. He did. But at the point in time when he, he, he took that trip, I think he was pretty much on his own. Yeah, but is that not how we measure the success now, you know, 30, 40 years later? 
that he, that he did gain an audience. I mean, there are plenty of people in this. Yeah, but you can't do that. You can't measure a presentation you made today 50 years from now. How are you going to do that? And how do we measure a level of success? Well, I mean, you can't measure it that way. That it was easy to do. I mean, again, to pick on Venturi, it was pretty easy to do what, what Brett did. What he should have shown is he should have shown the whole class or a group of projects. And some people may hit something at a point in time when a thesis is done. On the other hand, the thesis may lead to a whole series of things, and 20 years later, you have some idea about what you wanted to do or what you wanted to say and didn't know how. So I think, I think to make it easy for you to judge it might be to weaken the process. I think what we're talking about is a process of thinking. I don't know that there are any guarantees that it'll lead to a conclusion as clearly on a line as what Venturi seemed to do. But I wouldn't worry about that. I don't think that's the objective. I don't think it's, an, I don't think it's, it's uh, you're not looking for an audience. And I don't think it's a legal argument. I don't think either one of those are true. I think those are public relations discussions. They're not architecture discussions. They're promoters discussion. Kipnis is also not an architect. If nobody tells him about it and makes him part of the audience, he won't know. And to be a critic, he needs to know nothing personal. A lot of it is up to you. So what do you think the objective is then? If that's not the objective, what's the objective? I think, I think what we're talking about is how to learn, and how you can learn, and how you can formulate a project which suggests what you value, and why you value it, and how it might contribute in the future to the differentiation of the discourse in architecture. Which is not so easy. It doesn't always work. And it might work in whole, and it might work in part. I, I guess my question is about the whole history and how you use it towards a thesis. Um, because when Brad Steele talked about what is next, he at least three times said the next step is how history plays back into the discourse. As a moment, I think we talked about how you use it, either linearly or not. You have actually made a lot of examples of how history is not linear. So I'm wondering, um, you, you can understand there are very, two very different relationships between history in European culture and American culture in making a thesis and the way in which you look research. In a way, but I still really talked about methodology in an American way, you can make an argument out of anything, so any possible link that can prove the argument is a fair game as long as you prove the argument. Whereas I think that all the thesis you presented have a way to look at relevance in history, especially all the examples actually show had an incredible link to the reality of historical presence um, in a very European culture in the sense that there is a weight, a density in the culture and the history that you can just move of three, four inches, you cannot really completely change. So I thought that was really weird, uh, or anyway, a big question mark of how we use history next, let's say. Are we allowed to any possible link? What is the limit? And can historical reference actually point at relevance of certain thesis over others? Are problems more urgent? And can history actually define what the urgency is? Or history is a way for lawyers to make an argument? And every possible link is actually fair as long as you find that connection is. Well, that, you know, you, you had that Howard Bloom quote in there, Harold Bloom quote in there, which is, uh, I don't remember the title of the book. I Emily got me that book a long time ago. It's a, it's a very good book. And I don't whatever the, the reading discourse is here. Because it has to do with antecedents and how they, they influence your work. And essentially that quote was, 
make your own history, which I think is what you're talking about. I didn't say there isn't any history. How do you fabricate your own history? So this might be part of the art of the project, but associating ideas in some form is always, I think, I can't get into a long argument about what, what history is. I mean, you know that Burkhardt, Jacob Burkhardt, who was Nietzsche's famous uh, teacher, who said, who wrote a book called The Civilization of the Renaissance in Italy, 500 years after the Renaissance. So there was no Renaissance until Jacob Burkhardt said there was a Renaissance, an Italian Renaissance. And that was always interesting to me that the, that the nomenclature of the labeling, it doesn't mean that people didn't understand something was going on in Florence in the, in the 14th century. But, but the, the artifice or art of using antecedents to make a case is, is part of developing the kind of argument that I think we're talking about, which is different than what you said, which is, or you said, he said, which is now having quoted somebody who, in a sense, wrote his own history, then he told us what history would be. But you can't probably have it both ways. And he had said it had something to do with public policy and, and, and things like that. So I think what we're looking for is not to tell everybody. He told everybody what they did and how it worked out 50 years later. And then he told everybody what, what the next 50 years would be. And meanwhile, he also said that you have to make your own history or cite your own antecedents. I think some of those points are, are, are contradictory. And, and I wonder about that forecast. I've heard the forecast from a lot of people. So have you. Um, I, I have a feeling that whatever they're calling iconic ain't going away anytime soon to be replaced by sustainability, you know. Uh, so I, I think what we're saying is not so much we're trying to subscribe to a, to a view of history which he thinks is coming, but we're trying to imagine what it might be architect by architect. We don't put a sign up on the wall saying, the future will be big public projects, no icons, do that. We don't say that. I think he was saying something like that. I, I think I find interesting in the fact that you so much um, Venturing and his thesis, and which really referred to history in a very historical way, a linear way. I mean, when everybody was saying something else, clearly, but it was a very specific time in history, and it was only certain people that said something. He said something that was actually much more historical, much more present, much more relevant. Like, 90% of architecture is actually this. And these are the theses that then, after 20 years, this becomes a book. After 40 years, the book that has another preface that says, okay, he managed to see something that historically was myopically hidden at that point, but then he revealed it, not because he made a new history, just simply because he pointed at something that was already there. It was just more relevant, but nobody talked about it. I'm just wondering if there is a way to use history that is more relevant than others, because I feel like that is a key point of understanding how to use the material you use for three years towards, I'm not saying a successful thesis, but at least to frame a relevant argument. Well, I mean, I, I just would repeat what I said. I think that, that there is very little attempt to, to document antecedents to a project that contribute to its argument and suggest that as a topic, it's been a topic before. And we should encourage that. And secondly, there is, there is also very little attempt to record the project's own history and development in stages as certain decisions are made, which could theoretically have been different decisions. And we should do that too. Two quick following comments before we have to wrap it up. Uh, one, in relation to what you were saying, and I think in relation to the young ballet that you show, one way to understand part of the problem is to understand the kind of the present and history of the civilian knowledge, because 
I'm pretty sure that the choreographer and all the dancers of that ballet originally were trained as classical dancers and so on. And then, because they understand those rules, they can operate to break and create something that you don't recognize when you see it because it was a previous understanding of what was a stake. One thing, and the second one, uh, and being in Argentina, I cannot let go of the soccer thing without comment on it. Uh, it's true that to an extent we cannot teach that magic moment. But Brazil, between 1970 and 1994, they couldn't win a World Cup because they couldn't develop an update tactical system that allowed a structural logic that allowed that magic to happen in the people. So I agree we cannot teach that talent, but I think we can teach the infrastructure that allowed that talent to happen.